if you've got venture capitalists both either on your board or on your cap table as investors, at some point in time they're going to be pushing you towards exit scenarios faster than you might be ready because they want to, you know, they're in the business of making money for their investors of their funds. Uh, a lot of times you'll then see companies run what's called an auction process, which is to actually like engage a bank or an advisor to take that company and market it to the marketplace to see if you can attract a buyer and run sort of a formalistic sales process. Um, and that can take some time. If you just sort of get the one off, you know, you're at a networking event and Founder X meets Founder Y and Founder Y says, hey Founder X, I like your business, I'm going to send you a term sheet to buy it. Different scenario where you've got more leverage to probably negotiate, you know, either a deal that works for you or a deal that doesn't work for you. So at certain exit valuations where the investors might be making some money, the founders might not be making money. But on the flip side, usually the buyer of a company is interested in not just the product or service that the company is putting forth, but also the team, right? The team is typically important. And the team being important means the founders actually then generate themselves some leverage because they're usually going to go with the business and work for the buyer. So they can use that to negotiate better terms both vis-a-vis -vis their own investors and vis-a-vis -vis the buyers. Amongst the investors, you also have tension because, again, you may have someone who invested five years ago at a really, really low price where selling off relatively cheaply still makes them a bunch of money. But that selling off relatively cheaply doesn't make any money for the guy who's the new money in because it's actually at a price lower than what he invested at. So you've got that tension too, which is where you get to a lot of you know, documentation, legal documentation, checks and balances as to who has say over what and who can sort of block a sale, who can not block a sale, when do things you know, default to a board call versus an equity holder call, et cetera. And that's part of, again, hearkening back to the initial question altogether that we were talking about, setting yourself up for exit, when should you do it, as early as possible because as these things start to add up in your company's life cycle, uh, if you don't have a good plan in place, you can totally be locked up, at least from the founder's perspective. So to keep the founder sort of in a good position relative to their investors is important. Uh, again, there are certain things they can do. Uh, one is, you know, they can, for as long as possible, maintain voting control, at least on a fully diluted basis of the business. So, you know, a lot of times the founding teams start with what's effectively 100% of the business, and it shrinks over time as they either bring on more co-founders or they start taking on investments. Um, but if you can sort of delay the point at the point in time as to where the founders drop below 50%, you've obviously you're in a better position than if you drop below 50%. But it is sort of inevitable at some point in time that most companies in the founding team will drop below 50%. So then what do you do? The second thing you can do is try to maintain a board construction um, that's the governing body of your entity that is at least aligned with you, or at least you know you sort of control enough seats that your voice is still the majority voice at the table. And again, at some point in time, usually the aggregate investor voice, if you will, will probably exceed the, the founder voice or you know, some other independent directors will be added that exceed the founder voice. Um, but again, the longer you can do that, the better. Uh, and then the third thing is just you know, sort of a, from a contract perspective. The investors are going to want to make sure they've got certain protections so that you don't exit at valuations that aren't attractive to them. But the sort of more you can squeeze that in the founder's favor and the more flexibility you give the board and or the founders to actually be the determinators of, I can sell this business and nobody can stop me at certain prices or on certain terms, the better. And you see that as the dance between the founders and the investors when they're negotiating financing documents and stockholder agreements. Make sure you protect your brand. Get your patents filed, get your trademarks filed. Make sure the people that are building stuff for you are signing documents saying that your company owns all of your IP. Uh, that's another big issue we see that's really easily solved if you do the right paperwork, but really often overlooked. Spend a little bit of time and energy working with people who've been there before, who have the wisdom, and get them on your team, whether that be on your board or an advisory board or just an informal advisor to your company. Uh, and obviously there's formal engagements too. Get those people on your team and listen to what they have to say because they've been there before and they've done it. And even if what they're telling you sort of sounds uh, negative, right? Like hey, you should go spend $5,000 yeah. doing this kind of thing, or you should take your business in this other direction. Really consider those things because they're not saying them just to say them, they're saying them because they've been there before and they've done it. And so the totality of all that information, I think, is useful. And if you are a founder who's able to digest that stuff and process it, uh, it's really valuable stuff and it can really help you grow your business and get you to a great exit scenario, hopefully. Click to subscribe and see more at BuiltWorlds.com.